are listening to the United We Strike Radio Marathon for June 14th, 2014. Uh, just want to let you know that uh, I do have quite an august group waiting in the wings to do our uh, end of show roundtable conversation. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over at this time to Matt Navarro uh, to give us uh, some introductions here. Matt, it's all yours, sir. Take it away. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for producing today. And I'd like to thank our other producers, Alan James from Open Your Mind Radio and uh, Detlef from Wake News. Uh, without them, we couldn't be on the air, and they do a great job of getting our archives up in a hurry. Uh, so we really appreciate that. And we really appreciate you, our audience, for tuning in today and staying with us for the entire show. Or if you just joined late, uh, this is a part of the show that we really have come to enjoy as hosts here, where we gather around a virtual table and it is really neat because we've got people spread out all over the planet on this call uh to give you an indication of who's all here uh these are all hosts on on unitedwestrike.com by the way we have karen tostado in oregon we have dinah everett snyder who now resides in costa rica we have dr rima who's out uh down south in chile Kevin, who's in currently in Germany. Suzanne, who's up in Washington. Am, I think you're in Colorado. And uh, Los Gary. Angeles. Oh, you're in LA. I, I didn't realize that. Gary's out there in CIAville, um, uh, Virginia, and I'm out here in Oregon. So we gather here around this virtual table, which is allowed us by this fantastic uh, uh, technology called the Internet, with uh, which you know is is our only real weapon at this point to get information out about the things that concern us about the new world order and uh we normally on this show go around the table and that everybody uh give us uh, some of their thoughts and then maybe we'll pick a subject and kind of carry on a conversation about that and these can get very interesting and so we have a lot of folks around uh on the on the panel tonight, so we'll go around and give everybody uh, a chance to give a one-minute introduction of who they are and how they came to support United We Strike. Uh, I'll start first. My name is Matt Navarro. I'm the host of the New World Order Report, with, which airs here at 10 a.m. Pacific Time uh, on the UnitedWeStrike.com marathon, and I have another show called the New World Order Report on Wolf Spirit Radio the first month of first Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. I've been an activist on the internet for over 20 years. My website, Death to the New World Odor, was rated in the top 5% of all websites by Lycos. Uh, I was one of the first ones getting information out there about the Bilderbergs, the Council on Foreign Relation, the Illuminati, the Federal Reserve, and all that, and uh, was a big, big, big hit at the time. And I'm now affiliated with UnitedWeStrike.com and proud to be here gathered with all of you. Karen, you've not joined us for a while. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate being here. And uh, I just felt way back uh, when that we outnumber these people and that the best thing we can do would be to unite and to use our greater numbers against the people who are making our lives miserable because they are not working for us and it's about time I think we all grew up and started to understand self-ownership, cooperation, nonviolence, honorable defense and moral stewardship and if we embrace those then I believe that we can actually move out of where we are much more quickly than trying to fight them with their own game, through their own books and in their own courtrooms. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, glad you have a story and glad you're here with us. Dinah, you have not visited with us for a while. Tell us a little bit about your background in about a minute or so. <clears throat> All right. Um, yes, I'm Dinah Everett Snyder. I host uh, my own show over at Wide Awake News on Tuesdays. Um, I work <clears throat> with veterans um, and I work with autistic children. Um, I'm a parent. I homeschool my children. Um, I have a clinic in South Africa that treats AIDS, leprosy, malaria, um, cancer, uh, tuberculosis. We do it without pharmaceuticals. We do it holistically with food and supplements. And um, I, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Everyone, hello. I've really missed being on the radio with you guys. 
And that's about all I have to say. I'm just going to keep it really short. We missed you, too. Uh, we missed you, too. So, um, you know, once you get settled down and we can get you back on our marathons, we'd love to have you because uh, you're a really good source of information. You're like an encyclopedia. Dr. Rima LeBeau down there in uh, Chile, um, please give us a quick introduction. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, I'm a medical doctor. I've practiced drug-free medicine and psychiatry for about 44 years now. I graduated from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in 1970, which I'm happy to say is still within living memory. Um, I have another radio show that I would like you to know about, uh, which is called the Dr. Rima Truth Reports every Thursday night at Freedom's Lit. Dot com Studio B from 10 p.m. to midnight. Dr. Uh, Rima, please say that one more time. Uh, your your connection got a little squirrely there as you as you were telling folks where your where your radio show is. Rima truthreports dot com because there you will get vitally important information like the radiation information that I'll be talking about tonight if I have a chance, and you will have a very, very powerful way to join your voice to the other voices who are actually forcing these these murderous monsters to change their policies because we figure them out, we get the information out, and we force them to step back time after time. That's our power, using the Internet and using our joint message. It has to be the same message to them saying, don't you dare. Well, I'm glad you're out there doing what you do and that you do what you do because we need people like you. And, and you, you're proof that uh, there's more of us than they are of them. And when we exercise us, we can make changes. Uh, let's oh, yeah. See. Got Kevin out in Germany last I uh, spoke with him. Kevin, welcome to the show. Give us a quick uh, introduction. It's great uh, being back on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, I am... Um I'm here in Germany, and I have just uh, concluded or survived, I should say, a 46-day hunger strike uh, at the Vatican. Of course, uh, before um, um, my life has been uh, destroyed by uh, the powers that be, uh, our freely elected government and the international community, I was uh, a professional writer and analyst and uh, living a comfortable life in Canada. Uh, now, uh, for the past uh, and for the past uh, four years, uh, almost five actually, I have been engaged in a uh, battle of uh, David against Goliath, um, against um, the international world order, uh, and uh, have managed to uh, expose the global depopulation policy. Uh, and ever since, I have come. Uh, um, to the attention of uh, the global public. So now I am uh, continuing this, uh, this battle in the hope that we can uh, save our future uh, and our children. And uh, I am now, uh, as I said, in Germany and uh, en route here really because I'll be heading soon to uh, Romania to uh, start working and uh, finish hopefully within two months my uh, next book, uh, Survival or Extinction. Well, thanks for coming here. How do you say your last name, Kevin? Galilee. Galilee. Okay. Yes. Well, welcome, and uh, it's good to have you on board. Suzanne, how are you tonight? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Tell us about yourself. I'm a journalist, um, an independent journalist. I also have a media corporation, and uh, I'm proud to say that uh, Kevin and Dr. Rima are contributors to the U.S. Independent I'm appreciative of everything that they do, and it's important that we pay attention to good sourced information and people putting out good sourced information, because that's how we change the actual reality. Not by conjecture, not by supposition, not by theory, unless theory has been proven to be fact. Then we can go after the problem, fix the problem, and be done with it, and move on to the next problem, probably. So, In I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. So I write news articles. My website is OccupyCorporatism.com. I post about six days a week, about uh, three to five articles a day. And um, I appear on various radio shows like uh, United We Strike. Karen is a wonderful, dear friend of mine, and she asked me to come on with Vinny Eastwood, I think about at least a year ago. And I am 
a proponent of noncompliance. Because for me, in all of my research as a journalist and seeing how corporations do things, how governments and banks do things, how sneaky they are, the things that Gary and I talked about when I was having my segment, it's important that we understand these little intricate ways in which they work into our daily lives so that we can fix these problems. And for me, noncompliance is just the answer. If I'm not participating in the whole mess, then I'm not part of the whole mess and I don't have to worry about my contribution or, or my protest because it's not part of my reality. The more of us that do that, the, the faster this stuff will just go away. So thank you, Karen, for bringing me on, and thank you, Matt, for letting me talk so long. <laughs> we enjoy having you on with us, Suzanne. You're, you're a lot of inf- good, you bring a lot of good information and uh, help, I think, our audience to think about things. Uh, Am- so that's Suzanne Posel. Am Rosen, down there in L.A., I just found out. Uh, how about a quick introduction? How are you tonight? Oh, good. Nice to hear your voice, Matt, and greetings to all of you. You know, intelligence being one of the true aphrodisiacs, I would say United We Strike is an ever-escalating turn-on, and it's a pleasure to interact. Uh, I'm a health consul- I'm a philosopher, an author, health consultant, I've had 38 years of professional practice, uh, cross-integrating uh, uh, the disciplines of uh, or naturopathy, homeopathy, oriental medicine, a whole slew of various techniques and disciplines. But the most extensive work I've done throughout my life is, is in understanding human consciousness. And that plays a big part in working with people uh, and helping to readjust the body around the patterns that it's become locked into. And uh, as far as I- I'm a proponent of really understanding. Uh, I would say understanding is one of the words that defines my thrust. And uh, I understand not participating in things that are detrimental, but I want to see people be able to march into the middle of this, demand what really fulfills and satisfies, and not be suckered into the processes that are run amok. Even the people who think they're controlling them are just basically victims of the tools they've created. So part of my job is to liberate the human consciousness and give it access. It's always interesting to hear you speak, Amy. Uh, you know, just, just listening to your vocabulary gets my mind <laughs> clicking in a certain direction. Glad to have you here. Thank we you. have joining us, we have joining us a, a, a gentleman who's never been on the roundtable before. He was on earlier uh, talking with our good friend Detlef. It's Neil Foster. Uh, Neil is in Scotland. Neil, welcome to the show. Hi, Matt. I'm not actually in uh, Scotland. I'm in the south of England, but uh, I am Scottish. Um, oh, okay. But I, I can't remember, actually, how I first uh, got involved with United We Strike a, a number of years ago, and I had a little bit of time off and uh, came back again this year or, or late last year. Um, I just... Uh, I, I've been watching the UK uh, basically being ripped apart uh, through a number of um, factors, and right now, uh, they, they seem to be definitely trying to instigate uh, some kind of race war over here uh, with mass immigration. And uh, the, the mainstream press over here, um, basically, everything that could possibly go wrong, uh, that is wrong, is being blamed on, on immigration. And uh, I, in the UK, I, I see a riot coming this summer, uh, without a doubt. Uh, We've got Boris Johnson just ordered three water cannon uh, for the first time on the British mainland. We're going to have water cannon on the streets of London. And, um, well, well, we'll see what kicks off this year. But uh, I, I certainly expect some kind of trouble. That's not good news. But, uh, you you know, having you there, uh, and, and you do have a news organization, don't you? Uh, yeah, well, we have. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's more of a front organization, really, for things that are going on in the background. But, um uh, that's the community press group, which kind of started off as a social experiment to try and get people involved in in writing articles and and doing their own kind of research and uh, journalism. But um, people are just so apathetic; they're, they're very, very enthusiastic. Um, we, we did uh, training courses, which involved around about three hundred people over over a, a one year period, and basically four or five of them wrote things and then just disappeared off the scene. So. Got, kind of got back to square one, but that, that forum's still there for people to use if they want to use it. But uh, we're more involved in actually um, taking 
private prosecutions against individuals uh, rather than organisations. So we have cases at the moment um, ranging from uh, social workers who've taken children illegally to um, corporate manslaughter in the NHS and a, a very high profile case if it does um, finally uh, end up in the High Court, which it looks like it's going to do, um, for somebody who invented a, a rather well-known piece of uh, computer technology, and which was stolen by one of the big computer companies, and uh, who is the, la the lady concerned has uh, proven her case in the court, and the court, is the company concerned, is refusing to pay out the money, but it's now gone to the High Court, and uh, if that case comes off, um, it will make um, the world media because it has to. Well, it sounds like you're still being active uh, to try to, you know, affect change in your world. So welcome to the program tonight. Okay, since we – oh, wait, we, I miss Gary. Gary, uh, why don't you give us a quick introduction about who you are? Well, my name is Gary Hendershot, and uh, I'm the gnome behind the computer console that pushes all the buttons and turns all the dials. Uh, hmm, I've been an activist, I guess, since the uh, early – civil rights era, uh, the Vietnam War era, took a few years off to have kids and try to have a normal life and realized once my kids were growing up and getting ready to leave the nest, uh, a lot of the battles I thought we had won uh, turned out mm, at best we might have put them back a few years, but darn if they're not back at the same old game they've been playing for 50 years same old game, faster, harder, stronger than ever before. So, yeah, uh, uh, you know, at this point, I'm just an old southern boy with straw for brains that has a Monday evening show at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Rents Radio where I just comment on very complicated issues of the day and try to make sense out of them. And that's about as much as I'm able to do at this stage in the game. Well, I'm glad you do what you do. I'm glad you're here to be able to produce for us and host this roundtable on uh, some nice fancy equipment there you have in your underground uh, bunker. Yes, my secret but underground lab. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, go back around the table. And we'll open it up and give everybody, oh, let's say five minutes or so to, to tell us what's on their mind. And then once we go around and everybody gets a shot, uh, we can open it up to any kind of discussion we'd like to follow. Let's start with Karen tonight. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And I really also want to say thank you for picking up the uh, the hosting duties on United We Strike because it's enabled me to kind of step back, and now I'm involved every Saturday in the local farmer's market, which is a real joy. I am much more involved in the community than I was before, so it's that's nice. And I also appreciate, Gary, what you do and Detlef and Alan for all of the producing and everyone else here on the panel. So uh, something, though, that I would that's been pressing on my my heart and my mind is the topic of overpopulation. Now, I met Kevin and uh, he had joined me last night. I think we had a pretty good program on, on Wide Awake News. And uh, Kevin's work in exposing how they are depopulating us is just incredible. But I find myself totally disagreeing with his belief that we are overpopulated, as well as uh, I don't agree that it started right after World War I, because when you go back and you look throughout history, depopulation was first spoken about through Thomas Robert Malthus, who was a part of the English state church, and his main idea is that populations increase more rapidly than food supplies, so he figured there would always be more people in the world that can be fed, and wars and disease will be necessary to kill off the extra population. Um, I, I don't agree at all that we're overpopulated. I think they've been murdering us for so long and poisoning us for so long. You know, back in 1922, Margaret Sanger wrote The Pivot of Civilization. Uh, she had an introduction by the eugenicist H.G. Wells. Uh, the Rockefeller supported the concept of eugenics. Uh, this has been around for a, a very long time, and I don't believe that we have to focus on managing population control or mandating population control. My husband and I also watched an older movie called Tomorrow's Children. You know, Would you... Um, do me a favor, and if you're not 
could the rest of you mute your microphones? I'm hearing a lot of extra noise in here. I'm not sure where it's coming from. But anyway, my, my basic premise with getting involved with United We Strike and, and everything else and, and founding this is so that all of us can have a chance at a better life because we bring gifts to the table that are uniquely ours. And when you talk about preventing people from having children and trying to do a policy like China, I just don't, I just don't buy it because each and every one of us has incredible gifts that we have not been able to fulfill, many of us, simply because of the way that the system is set up. We've been so dumbed down and drugged and poisoned on so many levels. I think it's time for healing. I think it's time for us, instead of focusing on, well, there are too many of us and we got to make that a focal point, in any um, place that we're overpopulated, I think it's with the evil, lying, inbred, traitorous eugenicists who are the ones implementing these procedures. And I would like to see us simply focus on, again, self-ownership, cooperation, non-aggression, honorable defense, and moral stewardship. And that has nothing to do with money, but right now with so many of us who are sick and toxic, I think that any healthy people can be born uh, to contribute will be a blessing, as well as those of us who have challenges. And, man, I, let me try something here, because I'm having a hard time hearing. Can you still hear me if I do it like this? Yeah, but we get a lot of background from uh, background noise from you. Okay, well, I'll try and plug it in uh, again. And but I, I would like to hear from the rest of the panel. You know, who thinks we're overpopulated and what they'd like to do about it, uh, because I think it's a very important topic. And personally, you know, to me, each one of us is here by divine right, regardless of how we got here. Once we're here, we're here, and I think that we need to honor that in ourselves and in each other. Um, this okay, is Prima, and I would love to respond to to what you've just been saying. First of all, uh, is that okay, Matt? Can yeah, I do go, that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, first of all, I strongly recommend that anyone who believes that we are overpopulated visit a site called overpopulationisamyth.com, where in very simple, compelling terms, the entire fraud called overpopulation is debunked. And you don't need to be a scientist or a mathematician to understand it, but it's very powerful. Overpopulation is, in fact, a myth. We don't have overpopulation. What we have is an abundance of resources and an overabundance of greed and vicious mean-spiritedness by people who want to keep it all for themselves. They're called globalists. So the, the entire overpopulation mythology was created by the Rockefellers, John D. Rockefeller Jr., uh, funding organizations designed to propagandize the incorrect information that we are overpopulated and we're going to destroy the earth if we don't wipe out the, the most serious plague that the earth has, which is most of humankind. Um, zero population growth funded by John D. Rockefeller. Um, and it was something that I used to believe in when I had no money at all. I gave a dollar a month to Greenpeace and a dollar a month to zero population growth. And it meant frequently, that, quite literally, that I didn't get to eat as much as I would have if I hadn't done that. But it was that important to me. And then I learned that I should have eaten instead because this is a complete fraud. But it is the fraud, it is one of the frauds that is used to, quote, justify, end quote, the unjustifiable depopulation, genocide, to which we are being exposed through multiple channels, including one that I'll talk about in a little while, which is astonishing levels of radiation in the United States that are being hidden by the EPA, but we just nailed them. We found their proof, and... Um, we got them dead to rights on at this time. Anyway, the point is that we're not overpopulated. We're under generous, and there is plenty of resource for all of us. I actually agree with that. Kevin, we'll give you a chance to respond here in a minute. I want to get to Dinah uh, just because I had her in the list that 
way. <laughs> so let's get to Diana and we'll come <laughs> to you, Kevin, for, for a response. Okay, Diana, what's on your mind this evening? Do you want to continue that or do you want to talk about something else? Well, um, I would love to continue along the same thread because I think it's, you know, it's on all of our minds and it goes along with everything that we all discuss in various ways. And um, the ladies, of course, are right. Um, it is truly that this... I meet, of course, I've worked for think tanks over the years. Um, I just left one in San Francisco. And um, it's something that we thrash about continuously and have in all the time that I've been involved in academia, this concept of overpopulation. And what it, at its essence, it's really only um, a misappropriation of resources. And it goes to something that I talk about on my own radio show quite frequently. And that is this paradigm, this false paradigm under which we as a global community live. And that is the paradigm that progress is the beginning and the end for everybody. There is this relentless drive regardless of what country you live in, which political party is in power, there is this perpetual drive um, towards progress. And we are sold this concept of progress as being the holy grail of all societies and all life. <clears throat> when the reality is that the paradigm of progress is designed to pigeonhole people and contain resources um, and when you contain resources, you are withholding them from the people. This goes to the, the idea of money. For the very first time in human civilization, as we know it, the entire global community is tied to a single currency. Um, that means that any hiccup, any bubble, any gurgle, any drop, uh, any flood, will impact the entire global community. We saw the beginning of that in 2008. So actually, we, we, we talk about it as 2008, but the very beginning of that was 9-11. Um, and that's what we at the think tank level um, talked about for three years. Um, we sent out numerous white papers, um, which disappeared into the halls of power, <clears throat> not only in the U.S., but around the world. We, we did presentations at the U.N. regarding... Um, what we perceived uh, as historic fluctuations in, in money and in resources that were going to impact countries regardless of their ties to the U.S. and the Middle East. <clears throat> and we were ignored. And in 2008, that came to fruition. We have not recovered as a global community, and nor will we. And we will not be allowed to recover because we are all tied to the same paradigm of progress relentless progress at all cost. Now, the frightening thing about this concept of progress is that it is an enormous amount of, it is very um, resource intensive, but it is resource intensive for a very, very small percentage of the population. Um, and there is absolutely no trickle down to it for the general populations of the world at all. If you think about science and you think about medicine, um, you'll, get, you'll have an idea of, uh, you'll have some perspective on this. For all of the medical research and all of the trillions of dollars that have been invested in medical research in the last hundred years, we are operating today with less than 11% of what we know, what has been funded. Um, so we have this empirical evidence of all of these things. We know all of these things, and yet only 11% of it is available to the general populations of the world. When it comes to something like science, and, um, and under science you can talk about uh, space programs as well. In the last hundred years, out of all of the trillions of dollars um, across the world that have been spent on research and data collecting and sending things out into space and all of the data that has come home and all of the technology and the exponential technology that has, been, has come to fruition under these programs, we are looking at less than 17% of this being um, translated into anything that humanity um, can use on a daily level. And, that, and, and you know, 17% is, is one aspect of that. But it's mostly to do with fiber optics and the things that we use, our technology and our computers every day. It has not translated into a, a tangible improvement in, in the lifestyle of humanity. I mean, being able to Google YouTube videos is not a substantial improvement 
in quality of life. Um, it goes to more of an entertainment value. So this whole thing about um, progress is a misnomer, and it goes to a misappropriation of resources um, and being tied to the wrong values, um, and, and this goes to money. But a country is not as good as the amount of money that it has. A country is only as good as the amount of the labor force that it has and the resources at, at its disposal. And the vast majority of humankind has been severed from the resources of its own country. And under this is water. Under this is the right to grow their own food. Um, and this goes to oil. So we can talk about money. We can talk about politics, which is the entertainment arm of government. But ultimately, at the end of the day, all of these corporations, all of these entities begin and end with oil. And until we can address oil <clears throat> and what it brings to the table and what it takes away from everybody, I think we are slaying the wrong end of the donkey. I think you're right about the oil industry. Um, you know, on my website, nwodor.com, currently I have a link available for you, nwodor.com, that uh, shows a Israeli gentleman who, through water ionization, took his van, separates hydrogen from the water, and, and uses the hydrogen to power his van. And I've seen this with uh, a Japanese inventor as well. The technology exists that we can use water to fuel everything. Imagine if you could use water to fuel your jet planes, your your ships, your your trains. You could have a solar power solar panel on your house, powering a water ionizer, separating the hydrogen. You could use that hydrogen to run a generator to power your house. You would never have to live on the grid ever. As long as you had sunshine and, and access to water, you have all the power you need. Kevin, you were kind of on the hot seat this evening. <laughs> I'd like to give you a chance to respond to all of that. Well, being on the hot seat is a position I'm used to. <laughs> but uh, let's, uh, let's put it this way. A population uh, is a biological reality and a biological problem. And unless uh, interfered with or legislated, it grows naturally uh, quite fast. It, in fact, doubles every 30 years. So we're now at 7 billion people worldwide. That means that by, that by uh, the year 2040, just 30 years from now, we would be at 14 billion. And then 30 years later, by 2070, we would be at 28 billion. And then another 30 years later, by 2100, that's just at the end of this century, we would be 56 billion people on this planet. Obviously, this is impossible to sustain. Uh, and of course, I keep hearing, you know, the same argument again and again and again that affluence and modernity and technology uh, brings about, uh, you know, naturally small families. That is a complete misconception. The reason we have natu we have small families now uh, in the West and in all of the OECD countries is because our fertility has been secretly interfered with since 1945 by this covert programs of population control, which I have come to call the global depopulation policy. So let's say that even, even though we may not uh, agree or accept the fact that today uh, we are overpopulated at 7 billion, some of us find it overpopulated, others find it uh, quite uh, comfortable. But what about 30 years from now at 14 billion, when there will be twice as many of us on this globe? Will that be overpopulated or not? When we all have to live, you know, in uh, closet-sized apartments like in Hong Kong? Or what about by 2070 when we will be 28 billion? If we don't collapse long before then, which we will, most certainly. Will, will we then be overpopulated when our air across the globe is going to be so filthy as it is in Shanghai today where you can't breathe because your, your, your throat is aching and your eyes are, are, are burning? Is that going to be acceptable? No. You see... With every human being that we add to this planet, we also uh, impose you know, a tremendous burden on the planet because every human being consumes a truckload of stuff every year. And that comes from Mother Earth. And consumption uh, levels do not, uh, are not lowered by science and technology. On the contrary, they grow from generation to generation. It is just part and parcel 
uh, off um, off a uh, of an affluent uh, lifestyle, and that is just a human condition and the human nature. You know, we work and we struggle because we want to live better. We want to have more stuff. Uh, we want to, uh, you know, to see an improvement and progress. And that is why we struggle. And we want to leave behind for our children a better world. But that means that it doesn't matter how advanced our technology will be in the future and uh, whether, we, whether or not we will be able to avail ourselves of, uh, of uh, free energy technologies. Uh, the reality is that we still will be consuming a truckload of stuff every year and that all of us, all 7 billion of us or 14 billion of us, if we ever make it to that uh, outrageous number of people on Earth, will be consuming a truckload of stuff. And all of that is on Mother Earth's shoulders. Um, I, you know, we have to be honest and we have to trace the world's problems to their ultimate root cause. And I think that's what I have done, and I have done this in complete isolation from you know uh, from the uh, uh, the system or the United Nations or the international community. Um, uh, and yet, I have arrived at the exact same conclusion as they have. Of course, they arrived at this conclusion a lot earlier uh, because they were they were faced with uh, with this problem a lot earlier. Uh, it was obvious to them in 1945 that you know they cannot repeat uh, the horrible experiences of war, of global war. And they acted then and there, uh, and uh, in a sense, it's we have we have to thank them for doing so because had they not acted then and there, uh, the population would not peak. Hopefully, will uh, at least that's what they hope that the fruit of their labors of their sixty eight year old labors now uh, will result in, which is that the population will peak at nine billion by twenty forty. Uh, if they don't succeed, uh, all hope will be lost. Uh, because um, human civilization will collapse under the burden uh, of a lack of uh, resources worldwide. Mm -hmm. You see that we have we already have a good two billion people who are struggling from day to day, whose life is com complete misery. And we can talk uh, until we are blue in the face about you know uh, social justice and about a better economic system and so on. Uh, we have been trying to have a social justice and a better economic system for 2,000 years now, and we, have, we haven't succeeded yet. Yes, it has become better and better and better, uh, and yet, uh, because uh, human nature is not perfect, it is imperfect, as a result, our society and our system is also imperfect. And, you know, we can, we, can, uh, we can talk about wishful thinking and what could be and what should be and what ought to be, but the reality is that there will always be greed on Earth, and we have to work around this, and we have to live with you know with our uh, characters, you know, with our human uh, personalities, and we have to design a system that uh, that takes uh, in consideration uh, these these human factors. Um, so the root the cause of all our problems are overpopulation and uh, access to resources. That's why we struggle. That's why we labor is so that we can have enough each and every one of us. Uh, and if the society is designed properly, then uh, we we will hope that there is social justice and that there is uh, uh, economic justice in the world. But even though we've been struggling for so long, and yes, we have made the continuous progress, we are nowhere near there. So what I'm saying is, uh, what we have to do is we have to set you know realistic goals, taking into consideration uh, the realities on the ground. Um, what I'm asking is that we, 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 we have to expose you know, all of the secrets that our governments and the international community have kept from us, stop the secrecy of the deception, inform and enlighten the public of the problems and the realities that we face as a civilization and as a species so, we, so that we can be included in the future and not excluded because for the time being we are being excluded. And change, you know, from covert to overt uh, methods of population control and resource sharing. Because right now, because everything is happening behind closed doors, uh, above and, and beyond our knowledge, we are being uh, cheated of a future and we have been excluded from, uh, from uh, uh, economic well-being and even from the future because our genetic lines are being slowly shut down. And unless we, we accept you know, the brutal reality of resource scarcity and our population, uh, the uh, international community in the United Nations will not listen to us. They will, they will just ignore us because they will think that we are incapable of uh, staring reality in the face and acting accordingly. I agree with you that we, that we need to inform the public 
of this covert means. We agree entirely there. And uh, I'm glad you had a chance to, you know, give us a, a response to that. I don't agree with all of it, but, you know, Am Rosen uh, is a keen observer of the human condition. Am, your thoughts on this? <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, there's only so much of the more that any system, any containment field can handle. We start off because from where we are, we'd like to get away from the things that aren't working, that are hurting the quality of our life, and we'd like to be able to access things that, from where we're looking that will make our life better. So we start looking for techniques and methods and systems, and we create all kinds of things, and in the process of bringing them online, we're changed because they have given us more access. There's only, it, it, you, to become more is to become something eventually different, but we keep trying to funnel it back through the, the original uh, impetus, the intent we had, when we've already become something different. It seems like we're talking about quality of life, and unequivocally, without exception, the quality of our lives are determined by our state of mind. And that includes the physical state of the neuro neurological metabolic interface. But most people don't understand that. And they are absolutely overwhelmed. You know, in, in my own practice and dealing with people, I always tell them, I'm not going to make you aware of something that you're dependent on. Even if it's the self-torture of your own misery that you persecute yourself with, unless I can quickly and efficiently help you resolve it and give you a better space to go with it. Now, things are very mismanaged. And, you know, I like to tell people emotional constipation, because we have a lot of that, leads to psychological retardation. We need better management. But how are we going to achieve better management well it's a it's a process while we're dealing with all the things we're dealing with all the uh stuff that isn't working the obvious nefarious corruption that's going on well that keeps us locked in and it's exhausting and if most people don't understand it and you say this is a problem but they're just trying to get by what are they going to do with it? it you have to develop some psychological some intellectual scientific skills to be able to put this stuff into perspective but while we're holding back the crap, exposing it, looking at it, calling it for what it is, we also want to be forging ahead into what we do want and recognizing what's available to us it's, and strike a balance in between. We're not one or the other. This is the human process. Now, we're becoming something more. We're becoming something different, but we're terribly mired in the old impetus and the old drag lines. Anybody can quote scriptures, be they religious scriptures or political or marketplace scriptures or psychological or medical. And quite often it's the ignorant that do quote these scriptures. They are thoughts, thought constructs. They're ways of trying to process and orient ourselves to dealing with the resources that are available to us. My interest with all this, and I, I love what's being brought forth and, and the many very intelligent perspectives on this is to free up the nervous system, to finally enable it to catch up so that when you see this stuff in challenging it, you don't, the fear doesn't come up, that you can access it and you know how to adapt around it at will. You know, th there's a lot of people lost in their own power trip. And, you know, because they've been able to attain through cunning, through luck, through some skill, some hard work, positions that give them access to directing energy. Now, if you sat them down and you, there was no pressure, you say, hey, you know, this is bad for people. And, and they might even agree with you and say, yeah, yeah, but this is the human condition is what we're doing. Uh, it, but when they go back to their job, they're looking at statistics. They're detached. Because basically, they don't know any other way to preserve their space. They need to be helped. There ha we need a better form of managing the resources, and it starts with what we're doing, making people consciously aware. But when we do that, understand that even if we make perfect sense to people out there, and we're giving them insights they may not have had, uh, information, 
they're stuck. They've got a lot of invest, invested. There's a lot of irrational drag lines that are pulling on them. And we also have to give them the means to start to be able to resolve these conflicts so they can move ahead and participate in what's better, what's actually going to work. Agreed. You know, um, we keep coming back to having to inform our fellow human being. I think there is an awakening occurring, you know, but uh, as eloquent as you are, am I, I, I think the folks we're trying to reach will not be able to understand you. You know, the average person glued to their smartphone or their HD TV doesn't have the vocabulary to understand what you're saying, though I hope in our audience, we have people intelligent enough to, to hear what you're saying and, and can, you know, it, it will inspire them. Kind of like how Su- Su- Suzanne Pozel inspires us, right? Can, just, just before you, can I just respond to that? When, sure. Just for a second. Don't mean to cut Suzanne off. Um, when people come to me and from every walk of life, every age, every imaginable condition, I address my concerns according to who they are and what they are. The more they have questions, the better it is, because I want to take these things we're talking about in general and make them functionally and adaptively available to them in terms of their specific concerns and everyday needs. Right now, we're talking in the abstract, but the the more questions you have, if you said, okay, well, what would that mean in this circumstance? How do we adapt it here? I love that because I would these I while I'm talking in general about things that I truly understand. The thing is to make it accessible and adapted to everybody's needs. Indeed, Suzanne, would you like to continue our discussion on the uh, overpopulation, or did you have something else in mind you wanted to speak on tonight? No, I can continue the conversation. Okay. For me, part of the issue is the overpopulation. We get the information that we're overpopulated from the United Nations. So did they count every single head? I haven't filled out a consensus form ever in my life, and there are four people that I know that technically were not counted. The other part that bothers me about depopulation and overpopulation is that we have underdeveloped nations. We have underdeveloped nations because governments and corporations have created them. Africa is rich in any resource you can possibly imagine. Those people should be living high on the hog, but they're not. It costs more money to get a gallon of water because of water privatization in Africa than it does to buy a bottle of Coke. And people have died. There was a story coming out of Africa where a woman was out and she left her two small children behind and the neighbor was watching them. And one of the children set the hut on fire. And the woman didn't have enough... uh, credits on her water card to feed her children and her husband for that night and save the hut. And because of the smoke inhalation, the two children ended up dying. No one should ever have to make that choice. That choice was created out of scarcity, which was created by corporations and land grabs from the United Nations, who also, again, happen to provide us the information that we think that there are 7.5 billion people on the planet. So first we need to answer the question, are we overpopulated? If It's a question of resources and dulling out of resources. Who has control over those resources? Because the UK sent in a, um, a survey to find water aquifers in Africa two years ago, and they found an exorbitant amount of water underneath these people's feet. Well, if you take what happened in East Timor, where they found... Buku's amounts of oil underneath the East Timorian feet. And so Shell Gasoline got the contract to siphon that oil out, and the UN installed a de facto government to take care of the people and make sure that they didn't cause any trouble while Shell did their business. Then you could liken that to the resources of the underground water aquifers in Africa. The people of Africa are not going to benefit from the water that is underneath their feet because the corporations and the international body have created the scarcity. So if we have a problem of overpopulation, it's 
because of the United Nations using predictive models and doctoring information. If we have a scarcity of resources, it is because of United Nations land grabs in other nations where they want to create an entire food basket out of Africa controlled by corporations. That's not because people are suffering because they don't have access to food. In fact, the United Nations pop, uh, Population Fund says in their own documents that it is not how much food we are producing on this planet in totality that is the problem. It is access to that food. These people in these underdeveloped nations are not given access to their own food, so they're starving. So we need and to understand what a the actual problems are and answer these questions. Maybe we don't have a problem. Maybe we don't have an overpopulation <clears throat> problem, so we don't ha need to install depopulation protocols, uh, covertly or overtly. Maybe we have a resource problem because of the controls of governments and corporations, so we need to get that control back. Then we'll have all the resources we need, and no one has to go without. Indeed. Uh, I think it's a, a situation of manufactured scarcity. Going back to the hydrogen-powered uh, electric model, you know, water will always be available. We will never run the seas dry. So if you had hydrogen-powered generators running desalination plants, there is no reason why people on this earth cannot irrigate and drink healthy water that's not fluoridated. Neil Foster, you had a comment in our... Uh, chat room, why don't you uh, tell us what you were thinking about overpopulation? Well, first I have to agree with uh, Suzanne there. I mean, the, the United Nations, we have to remember who set them up in the first place, and uh, the League of Nations, and, and it was actually the corporations themselves who set the United Nations up um, to benefit them and nobody else. Um, and what you just said about water is absolutely correct. I, I've never been able to get an answer from anybody in the Green Party as to where the water goes that they keep telling us is so short um, because there's as much water on the planet now as there ever was. It doesn't go anywhere. And as you say, um, you, there's enough water in the oceans to keep us all going if they just uh, built desalination plants. So th there is no water shortage. That, that in itself is a, is a fallacy. Um, but it is it is a problem getting it to where it needs to go. But um, again, that's just that simple uh, engineering and uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter what people think about Gaddafi. Uh, he was he was supplying water to uh, large parts of Africa and green, greening the Sahara. So, you know, he showed it was possible. Um, as to the perception of over, overpopulation, uh, it is a myth. It's an absolute myth. And uh, Thomas Malthus, Malthus uh, the English vicar, um, a so-called uh, mathematician, uh, was, was totally shown to um, have made uh, false calculations, bogus figures, and he's been proven wrong uh, time and time again um, with this um, this assumption that um, food supply would um, uh, decrease as the population increased. Uh, even even the UN, regardless of what you think of them, has had to publish figures to show that food supply is outstripping population growth. Uh, so that's a fallacy. Uh, they even had to say that uh, Africa could feed the world. So you, you've got to ask the question, why is Africa starving? And um, as Suzanne says, it's, it's because it's a deliberate policy of the United Nations, without a doubt. Um, they just don't like black people. It's as simple as that. And the people who founded the United Nations and the League of Nations, uh, the Rockefellers, uh, the Warburgs, the, the DuPonts, uh, the J JP Morgans, all of them, uh, they're eugenicists through and through. And it's, it's as simple as that. They, they want um, poor people off the planet, whether it be black, white, Chinese, it doesn't matter, Indian. Uh, they just want their own uh, core group of people to move on to, into the future and have all the world's resources to themselves. And uh, they're doing quite a fine job of it at the moment uh, because, uh, as you say, they, they've, they've got the, the water, they've got the, the power, they've got the oil. They have all the world's resources under their um, their global banner. And, uh, you know, the world belongs to all of us. Uh, every 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 person on this planet, every animal on this planet has a has a right to the resources of this planet, and uh, nothing that's essential for life should be privatised and taken into into private corporate hands and bankers uh, to to feed um, their view of uh, what the earth should be and, and who should own it, because nobody should own it. I think, uh, you know, Africa. Uh, I think, like Suzanne was saying, is rich with resources. It's a, a really rich continent and could be very well um, developed 
for the people that are there. But my observation is that, you know, through the British and American and, and banking uh, cartels, they create destabilized uh, governments there so that the people cannot develop. You look at Gaddafi. He was doing something good. He was going to go to a, a gold-backed currency. They, they killed him. They're trying to do that with Assad. So they destabilize the area to maintain control of those resources and tell us that these people are starving because they don't have access to resources. <laughs> or they, you know, just too many of them. So uh, I, I would agree with you on that one. Gary, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, I hear both sides of the argument, and, you know, I guess I kind of walk a line in between. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is centralized wealth is responsible for many of the technological advances that I personally find very enjoyable. I think about it, okay, right now I'm sitting in my secret underground bunker just 12 miles south of Washington, D.C., and uh, I'm sitting here very comfortably in my shirt sleeves. It's rather hot and muggy outside, but I'm enjoying air conditioning. Um, I'm probably using more electricity during the few hours that I produce this broadcast uh, than the typical person in Africa will use in a, in a lifetime. Um, you know, I, I think about the lifestyle that I've grown accustomed to, that, that I'm comfortable with, and I think, well, gee, you know, I'm, I'm a greedy pig because, uh, you know, I'm using, I'm burning all these lights, I'm running all these computers, I'm, uh, I'm running my air conditioning, you know, and I'm, I'm living comfortably and I'm very, very well fed while, you know, this poor schmuck in, uh, uh, in Africa is, uh, living a, 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 a desperate life uh, where, you know, they're not really even sure where the next meal's coming from. And I scratched my head and I said, gee, well, you know, what, what is fair about this? And you know what? There's nothing fair about it. But, you know, there's nothing fair about human existence. I'm fortunate. That poor schmuck in Africa is unfortunate. Uh, now, here in the U.S., up until we started getting invaded from the south, uh, our population was actually on the decline. We were starting to, you know, our population was starting to head down. Of course, with, you know, 20 or 30 million coming in from, from the south, um, yeah, our, our population in the United States is starting to increase again. But see, that's what we're going to experience if population is not brought under control. We're going to have these uncontrolled migrations where desperate people, from Africa are going to look towards Europe and they're going to say, wow, you know, things are so great there. You know, I'm going to do whatever I have to do uh, to, to migrate from, you know, where things are bad to where things are good. And the systems that right now most people in the world would consider affluent can't possibly sustain that affluence if they're overwhelmed by uncontrolled immigration, which you know, a, lot of, a lot of the developing world is seeing right now. So we're already starting to see populations react to the pressures of, all right, lack of resources, okay? We all agree. I, I'm in perfect agreement that the world is bountiful. The world is really rich in resources. The problem is it does take an accumulation of wealth to be able to exploit those resources. You, whether we like them or not, we need the Rockefellers of the world or whoever is pulling the strings uh, to uh, put up the money to invest in the equipment and the manpower to extract those resources and make them available. So it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I, I just I can't get on board with the communist philosophy because, frankly, it's been proven to be a failure. Every example of a communist system where we go into it with this altruistic point of view where, gee, you know, we're, we're going to be good guys and everybody's going to get a fair shake, everybody's going to get a fair share, every society that has moved in that direction has failed. At the other extreme, 
the hardball fascist system, similar to what we've got here in the United States, every example of a fascist nation has proven to be an absolute failure. So, you know, a lot of it has to do with our perception of the isms. You know, whether you're a communist or you're a fascist or you're a capitalist or you're a this-ist, it doesn't matter. It's all these isms. You know, we, we, we seem to have a finite version of isms that we can ascribe to. If we're going to be an economic powerhouse like the United States or Europe, we're going to lean towards fascism and we're going to have an extreme wealthy group at the top that you know, just runs roughshod over everybody. But, you know, we just have to be fortunate enough that they're uh, uh, beneficent enough to, to let a little of that trickle down so that average schmucks like me can have their air conditioning and their computers and burn their lights. If we run towards the communist-type approach, uh, there is no incentive for anybody to excel. There is no incentive for anybody to, 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 to succeed at anything. So we find that what, what happens is we, we get, you know, uh, a malaise of mediocrity where there is nothing extraordinary going on. So, you know, where do we find the solution? Where do we find that happy medium where we have the centralized wealth required to exploit the resources of the earth but the common sense to be reasonable about how that wealth is distributed. Where do we find that ism? I don't think that ism exists. I believe in freedom. I believe that man, woman, aside from the basic needs of food and shelter, is, uh, aspire to freedom. You know, they, they want to be able to choose the God they want to believe in. They want to make, be able to make the choices of who they have contact with and what they think and have their thoughts be their thoughts and not one that was put there by somebody forcefully. And we had in this country at one time a constitution and a Republican form of government. We had and I believe that because that the, the Constitution identified for the first time in human history that the individual was the sovereign. There was no other one above him except his God should he choose to believe in one or not. And we had that. And, this, and we had a monetary system that was issued by the government backed by some precious metal. And that system worked for at least 100 years or at least until... 1913, and, and, and the people had a chance by their own energies, their own inspiration uh, to, to become who they wanted to be, bringing forth the Rockefellers of the world who said competition is a sin. And they have made that apparent from the very the tops of our, our corporate structures now. There is no competition, and people do not have the freedom to exercise their ability to be inventive. You look at the people who, who brought free energy science to us. They're no longer here because they threaten the Rockefeller and, and, and British control of, of the world's oil supply. So we have had an example. I disagree with you, Gary. We had an example, and it worked for a while. I suggest... That humanity, given the opportunity, can find answers to its own problems and not have it dictated to them by some global elitist cabal who doesn't have our best interest in mind, but their own aggrandization and profit. So I, I, I believe freedom is the basic instinct that we have, and we should be able to exercise that. Given that freedom, that guy in South Africa or that guy in Mali or that guy in Libya who wants to create something like a community farm, has access to, 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 to tractor equipment, can feed his community. That can happen. 
given the opportunity. But this artificial scarcity that is being imposed on us by these corporations is preventing that. And they give us this mythology that we're overpopulated so that they can justify crushing humanity which they're doing a damn good job of. And that's why I sit here at unitedwestrike.com every month, and I'm so glad that all of you join us because we are at that point in history, and we cannot deny that unless we choose to, where either we do something now, not yesterday, not tomorrow, now, at this point in time now, lest the human become extinct, the species will vanish. Only 10% of us will be left. So, with that, I thank all of you for coming tonight and sharing your thoughts. Uh, we've gone around the table and we've hit our hour mark. So, I'm, I'm going to, um, I guess, I guess I'd like everyone to, to take a few moments, give us some parting thoughts, promote your websites, your books, and how we can contact you. And I invite all of you back next month. Karen, let's start with you. Well, thank you very much, and I think it was a really interesting conversation. Um, Kevin, I, I really believe that your research is, is terrific. I just think that there are a few points that need to be expanded upon because trusting in government or trusting in the UN, you know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and I personally don't want the UN to listen to us because I think the UN right now – uh, until it's completely overhauled, is totally um, against the people. If you look at what they did in Katanga, uh, then uh, Mozambique, you know, the United Nations has a long history of cruelty. And there's this is an abundant world. And we don't need, like, all the big money to go into the pits to, you know, you have to have money. We all do the work anyway. I think that a conscious evolution really needs to happen so that we understand completely our value has nothing to do with anything outside of ourselves. What we creatively bring to the table is what's important, what we can offer, what we can do, helping each other. We do the work and the resources are there. When people are inspired and especially inspired locally, I personally think it's an absolute insane um, way that we have to have food travel about 1500 miles before it hits our table. We ought to be able to grow that locally and then get together in some of the bigger things. But, but this is a created false scarcity. And I thought, Suzanne, you made some excellent points. You know, that they're keeping Africa on life support because they want the resources. So I will continue to believe that each one of us is here by divine right. And once we are here, we need to be honored and to recognize that we don't have to make it quite so difficult. We don't have to look at pieces of paper or voluminous notes or things written down by people we never met. Self-ownership, cooperation, non-aggression, honorable defense, and moral stewardship. And all of those are capable of us giving to ourselves. So I want to thank you all for being here and for kicking around this uh, topic. I'm hosting on uh, Wide Awake News the second Friday of every month, and sometimes I pop in there. I'll be popping up other places, and if you want to see what I'm doing, um, I'll be updating my blog on United We Strike. Thanks again for continuing the marathon, and I really do appreciate how what a great conversation we can have here today. Thank you, Matt. always appreciate your voice in these discussions and what you have to say, you know, um, Back when I first heard you, uh, and I can't remember, I guess it would have been on the Michael Rivero show, you said I was the first person to contact you about, you know, the tax thing thing or whatever. And and always hearing the enthusiasm in your voice uh, is good, you know. You, you really have passion there, so it's always nice to visit with you. Dinah, always nice to visit with you as well. A wealth of information. I hope you can join us next month with, you, and I hope your technology gets catches up to you. Uh, any closing or party <laughs> thoughts for the for the month? Thank you, Matt. Um, you know the fact is that freedom of any sort is a myth, and it's seeped in misconceptions. Freedom isn't given. If it has to be given to you, then you never had it. The reality is that we are born free and immediately enslaved. Of course, there's a long story as to how we become enslaved, and I talk about this on my radio show. I talk about the free men on the land and the differences between free men and sovereignty and sovereign citizens. 
I want to go to something that Suzanne said, which really hit the the nail on the head, and that is this this thing about resources and cultures uh, and the diversity of cultures in different in different ways. And she didn't exactly elaborate. So let me say this. More water in Africa is owned by multinational corporations globally than is owned by the people that live in the, on the land um, of Africa. There are more biofuels grown on available land in Africa for export to first world countries than food grown for export or for the people of Africa on the continent of Africa. Libya sits on an enormous underground aquifer of fantastic water that is rich in minerals that would go a long way towards correcting selenium deficiencies, magnesium deficiencies, and other deficiencies that not only the people of Africa suffer from, but that people in other countries that suffer from immune disorders that, that end up with cancer, um, that, that have what we perceive of as being uh, HIV and AIDS. The water um, under Libya would go a long way towards correcting that. Um, instead, we have a situation where, well, no one's brought this up, but we have this current thing with fracking. Fracking uses an enormous amount of water, um, usually in countries that can least afford to be giving away that water um, to be completely and utterly spoiled forever, um, where it then has to be contained, um, and it's not ever adequately contained, and it seeps back out into the water table and contaminates everything. So... This goes to this whole thing of quality of life and resources and manufactured scarcity. Um, and it, it, I think everyone on the round table tonight has really thrashed this, this out and, and given food for thought to the listeners. And I want to urge the people of the round table and also to our listeners that there is never one solution. There is never one problem in isolation, and there is no silver bullet. This is a very nuanced, multi-layered concept of overpopulation, of culling of humanity. All of these things are incredibly nuanced and incredibly overlaid uh, and interdependent upon each other. Um, something that we didn't really talk about this evening was this thing about race. Um, we as white people have been trained into an utter knee-jerk reaction regarding race. But I think our current political system in the United States has been milking this race card ad nauseum since President Obama took office. And it's time that we are able, as, as a global society, irrespective of our skin color, that we are able to put this race card on the table and talk about it, shine a light on it, and move past it because it is absolutely being used against us. Um, if anyone wants to listen to my show, it's on Wide Awake News on Tuesdays. If you want to contact me, you can via email to canarychronicles at outlook.com or directly to dineverettsnyder at hotmail.com. Thanks, everyone, for an amazing roundtable, and I'll see you guys next week. Next month, yeah, next week. I'm over-eager. <laughs> we, we're eager to have <laughs> you back. We, we like uh, having, you know, what I like is all the different accents we get over the course of the marathon. You know, we really have a global broadcast of people from around the world who have the same concerns about the extinction of humanity. Dr. Rima Lebo down there in Chile went to escape the radiation of the northern hemisphere talked no, about no no that's not quite true i okay. have to say no i did not uh i went here in order to bring clean low radiation certified organic food to the northern hemisphere following fukushima um the the radiation levels that we've unearthed are now so bad that I would have escaped had I known them, but uh, the the fact is that there can be no clean, low radiation food grown in North America and in Europe and China and any place in the Northern Hemisphere at this point. And this is a disaster, unless, of course, advanced technologies are applied and the governments of the world have absolutely no interest in doing that. I didn't mean to contradict you, but I didn't come here to escape. I came here to bring resources back to the Northern Hemisphere, but at the same time to create those same resources 
for the southern hemisphere and to enhance uh, uh, agriculture and uh, uh, the availability of clean food here as well because only a conquistador sees a valuable resource and rips it off from the country and takes it to the home country to feed the coffers of the king and queen as European history and so many other histories have done for so long. I stand corrected. But, well, we appreciate like having to, you here. <laughs> thank you. I'd like to, to uh, make one very important um, uh, addendum to what we've been talking about that we haven't spoken about yet. To find out more about these vitally important data about the incredible radiation levels that are that have been hidden from us and see the proof of that um, of that deception that's been going on for years before F Fukushima I urge you to go to tinyurl.com forward slash Fukushima fire there are two ebooks to download free there one is the one that will give you the information that I've just been talking about and the other is one that uh, the president of our foundation, General Stubblebine, wrote a couple of weeks ago on the real situation at Fukushima. Can you afford not to pay attention to this? No, you cannot. And it is part of the depopulation agenda. Radiation is one of the depopulation technologies. Thank you for that. You know, I tried to get to that website and I couldn't. And oh, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, surprises doesn't surprise me because I can't get to a lot of your websites in particular. I can get to Infowars.com just fine, but to your websites, always blocked. So if you would, you must be mind, doing a great job. Yeah, well, you know, you, you, that is indeed, if if they're trying to block people from accessing your information, you must be doing something right. So I would appreciate it if you could please email me a copy of that report. I, I'd be interested in taking a look at it. I will certainly do that. If people are having trouble getting to that website, uh, let me give you another website uh, to which you can go. There are many. One is called Truth About Agenda 21, truthaboutagenda21.com. And uh, not only do we have some free books and so on to download there about Agenda 21, but um, once you're on the mailing list by putting your email in, then you'll, you'll have access to all of the other things that we do, including these new um, e-books. So uh, thank you for telling me that, uh, that the site is blocked. On the one hand, I'm very upset, and on the other, I take it as a deep compliment by the... Uh, uh, the the fascists who are listening. <laughs> Indeed, and we enjoy having you here, and we look forward to having you again next month, Kevin. Um, I can't I, I can't say I agree with you, and and we had this discussion on my show uh, on Wolf Spirit Radio, but I do appreciate your research and and your passion to expose the new old odor agenda of depopulation. <laughs> your closing thoughts, sir. Well, poverty is the result, result of resource scarcity, not vice versa. You see, if resources were abundant, there would be no poverty. And uh, this was realized early on, and uh, the entire effort of the United Nations and its agencies is meant to break the cycle of poverty. But in order to do this, to break the cycle of poverty globally, they had to coordinate and cooperate globally which meant, you know, a lot of loss of freedom, uh, this individual freedom that we all want and, and scream about. Now, let me put this in human terms, in most simple terms. When I was in Rome I, on my hunger strike, I was walking to St. Peter's Square every day, and every day I was passing by at least five or ten beggars. You know, I'm a very generous person and uh, kind-hearted, and uh, it, it pained me to see them there, you know, begging and poor and skinny and uh, miserable. And I gave as much as I could. But I was there myself on donations from people who were supporting uh, my work. So, you know, I couldn't just be giving uh, away other people's money as much as I wanted to. Nor could I give these people uh, any jobs because, you know, there, just no, there are no jobs available. Uh, and I would have loved to be able to give those people jobs. Now, you take this now, uh, uh, this picture, uh, this individual picture, and blow it, you know, to the national level. And you have the exact same thing. Western nations and uh, the, the wealthy nations who have industrialized first, you know, have been uh, helping the developing world since 1945 when the United Nations was set up to, uh, um, you know, to bring them out of poverty. And what they realized is that the more they gave, 
uh, the more poverty they created because the more people were born into the world. Uh, and they're you know fighting for the same resources that were just not there, and it created a uh, a system of dependence. So they changed tack. And around 1975, 1980, they said, "No, we can't do this. We're just feeding the monster. You know, we're we're creating more poverty and misery than uh, than solving it." So they they changed tack. And yes, they are creating uh, artificial scarcity because they are subverting the family structure, and they are subverting our uh, our uh, fertility in order to. Uh, diffuse the the over the overpopulation bomb, uh, and because that is the only way you're going to bring the population within uh, existing resources and kill this this monster, the monster of poverty due to lack of resources. You know this is a reality which we just can't escape. Doesn't matter how much we want to escape this. This is a material reality that humanity has fought against since times immemorial. Because as long as we live, we need things to consume, and uh, we have to get them from Mother Earth. That is wow. uh, that is the reality. Um, you know, we we can we can dream here about you know per- perfect system, but the perfect system does not exist and probably will never exist. We're making progress from generation to generation, uh, but until such time as these two huge issues, which is the overpopulation issue and the sharing of resources globally rather than just nationally, until these these two problems are solved and the system is created that can solve these address these two problems globally. You know, we're not going to make any headway. We're going to be chasing our tail again and again and again. And we'll never escape the cycle of poverty. I, I hope you're wrong. I hope you're wrong. And I, hope, and, and I have hope in humanity that we can, given, like I, said, like I said before, given the opportunity to be able to decide freely of how we proceed. I think we have the ingenuity to be able to work together and have the consciousness of resource management and, and, and um, stewardship that we can survive, given, again, the opportunity. Uh, Am Rosen, your parting thoughts this evening. Yes, and, sir. Uh, plug your websites, too, please. Oh, I w- thank you. Yes, sir, ladies and gentlemen, step right up and get your red hot fully refurbished, strategic variation on the same old theme. We, it's that fa- ever, ever goading phantom carrot hung danglingly, enticingly, just out of reach before the behaviorally conditioned, horribly inhibited beast of burden. I think it was Gary that mentioned this stuff isn't there. We, I think everybody's mentioned, well, in one way or the other, you know, we're not looking for perfection. The nature of life is motion and change. I like to say we're, what we're really looking for is optimal functioning. What allows us, according to circumstance, what's available to us and what levels of consciousness are online to integrate it in function op- optionally. Um, If it's not there, you know, privilege, if you see the need, then you have the privilege, you've recognized it, of accessing the uh, spatial relations and energies that come with that recognition. But that also breeds responsibility, our ability to respond. And right now, those abilities are disarranged, they're, they're scattered. You know, thinking about, somebody mentioned fracking. You know, well, we need more energy, and uh, th- this gives us more power. We can control things, but we're also, as b- has been mentioned, poisoning the groundwater. We're creating a big mess. It's kind of analogous to the uh, cow that gives a great bucket of milk and then happens to kick over the pail. We are doing this to ourselves continuously. And what we... It, it comes back to state of mind. You know, if, if somebody else mentioned the problem with the way we look at race, all these things, if we sit down, most people are basically decent, if, if you give them a chance to be. But when they feel too tired, too worried, too insecure, they revert back to the irrationality of the subconscious. And this is what is not understood, no matter how much sense we make out of things on the intellectual level. Most people are not operating from that level. They're operating from the irrational, illogical, unreasonable aspects of the psyche locked in the feeling level, which, as I mentioned earlier today, can 
can be permanently dismantled and freed up and made accessible. But as long as they're in place, well, if you're insecure, you have group identity. This is tribal. This is primitive. You don't even have to think about it. You may rationalize. We may just try to justify it. But it gives us we're defending our position, and at the same time, it's a motivating factor. We normally don't assert ourselves, but now we have a cause, a reason to bring parts of ourselves online that are, uh, that are adrenalized, that make you feel like you're doing something, you're kicking ass or whatever. All of these are reactive patterns, and as long as they dominate the way we look at things, the mess continues. So the thing I want to always mention is that this stuff can be resolved. It's completely understandable. And I would like to see what happens when people are freed of all this and have more access. Um, you'll find, uh, if you go to my website, www.lifegame.com, you'll find uh, well, a lot of things. You'll find the processes that I've mentioned, the Geigers, some podcasts, uh, some excerpts from my two most recent books. You also find some uh, uh, connection to some of the shows. De Dr. Dean Lloyd and I do uh, State of Mind, Quality of Life, first Friday evening of every month. And uh, twice a month, we, uh, we participate. Dr. Lorraine Hurley on her show on Common Awareness uh, kind of jumps in but turns it over to us. And we have Evolving the Species. We have different guests on and try and look at what their position is and expertise and, and discuss it, kind of our own roundtable there. Uh, also, been, we just did an interview on cannabis, very interesting, with OYM, uh, Open Your Mind in Ireland. That's on their archive. And uh, doing a, a number of shows with Dr. Hurley on the nature of consciousness. So I thank you all. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to be able to share and participate with you. And thank, thank all our listeners uh, for allowing us to share with you. Tell Dr. Hurley a hello for me. I haven't spoken to her in a while. She had been a guest on my show and a participant in the UnitedWeStrike.com uh, a few years back. And it's good to see that she's got a daily show now on a, on a, on GCN Network. And we thank you, Am Rosen. Uh, Suzanne Posel, always a pleasure. Your parting thoughts for the evening and give us your websites, please. I'm very grateful to have been part of this conversation. I think it's important that we have open dialogue and open conversation because we need to get to the actual facts. Are we overpopulated? Are we lacking in resources? Does anyone control the resources? Is anyone forcing depopulation agendas through vaccines, food, water, whatever means? Are we choosing this knowingly or unconsciously and so these kind of conversations f for me open up that dialogue so we can get to the truth and get to stopping what's hurting us and not participating in what's hurting us that's why non-compliance is such a great option because you're not part of the problem you have a solution and if you are the change that you wish to see. If you don't see anyone being kind, be a kind person. If you don't see anyone helping someone who needs it, go and help them. If you have more than you need, share it with people who don't. If we take care of ourselves and pay it forward, then others will take care of themselves and pay it forward. And then on and on it goes. And our society changes. We have a change of mind, societally, globally. We do not put up with abuse in any form, whether it's personal, uh, professional, or governmental. And our entire way of looking at resources, population, corporations, government, banking systems, all shifts to the benefit of people because we recognize that we are creating this. And so if we're going to participate in something, let it be what we are consciously participating in from the goodness of our heart, because that is what propels us towards success. My website is OccupyCorporatism.com and TheUSIndependent.com. And thank you again for having me and for allowing me to participate in this conversation. Thank you, Suzanne Posel. We've lost our moral compass. <clears throat> That's why we're here. And, and everyone here has that moral compass and I, and I hope that it 
impresses our audience enough to to follow through with doing the simple things of planting those seeds of knowledge for others, paying it forward, like you say, Suzanne. Neil Foster, what time is it over in, in England for you right now? Uh, it just turned 2 a.m. Oh, boy, thank you for hanging out with us and <laughs> uh, paying attention. Uh, your your party thoughts for this month, and give us your website, uh, please. Well, the, the website's uh, the communitypressgroup.com. I, I also host a, a radio broadcast at 8 p.m. on a Monday and a Thursday. Uh, that's UK time on awakeradio.co.uk and awakeradio.us. Um, it's, yeah, I, I can agree with Kevin on, on many aspects of, of how they're doing this, how they're depopulating the planet. But um, what would strike me is, particularly say, like uh, GMO, uh, at what point do they stop depopulating? Because they can't with GMO. They're never going to be able to stop it. So, you know, uh, if they were concerned about, uh, you know, depopulating, if, if we really were overpopulated, which I, I don't believe for a second we are, and uh, I don't think we ever will be. I think we'll uh, we'll control it uh, naturally ourselves. Um, at what point do you stop depopulating when, when you have no control over it? When it's out in the environment as as GM or or vaccines which um, go intergenerationally, at what point do you stop? You can't. Um, the UN is a benevolent organisation. Uh, well, history would tend to suggest otherwise. Um, they were they were supposedly created to um, ensure world peace. Well, has anybody seen world peace in their lifetime? Uh, we see, we seem to have uh, wars since I remember, and I'm I'm 51. You know, I've never seen world peace, uh, and uh, from what I can see, we're getting further and further away from that, um, with a potential third world war, the way uh, they're going. The United Nations is declaring war on people now. Um, what can you say? Uh, the United Nations is not and never has been a benevolent organisation, uh, any more than we should trust our politicians, our governments. Why should we trust them? Because they're made and cut from the same cloth. That's, that's really all I've got to say on that. Indeed. Well, we appreciate your thoughts. <sighs> yeah, the United Nations cannot be the cause and the answer uh, in one. I don't, I don't see how that's possible. Mr. Gary Hendershot, our great producer, thank you for hanging out with us and producing this roundtable. Intriguing discussion this evening, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, there's a lot of different opinions. And, of course, you know, being an old Southern boy with straw for brains you know most of this stuff is right over my head but you know i i try to make sense out of some of these issues uh must admit it's it's difficult to but you know there are some things that are kind of self-evident and when you got a guy who's willing to spend millions and millions and millions of bucks to get himself a job for four years that pays about a quarter of a million bucks a light should go on over your head. So when we start thinking about our institutions, you know, be it your local government, your national government, or the oncoming freight train that may indeed wind up becoming a world government, when you start thinking about these institutions, you, you can pretty well figure i mean even even an old country boy with straw for brains can can look at him and okay now this this guy is willing to spend millions of bucks to get himself a job that pays a quarter million dollars for four years the math don't add up uh there's got to be something going on on the side here that i'm not a part of that i'm not party to that i have no influence over uh right now our governments govern they're there to maintain control for those who have the money to buy the political influence. If you could really change something by going to the polls and casting a vote, if you could really change something by going out and carrying a, a sign and yelling, hell no, I won't go, or what do you mean we're going to war with Iraq again? Uh, if you could really change things by those means... Even an old country boy with straw for brains would tell you those things would be made illegal. Uh, bottom line is the system will only 
respond to force. Noncompliance, that is an application of force. When you turn your back on the powers that be, laugh, dance, and sing in spite of them, you can count that as a minor victory. That's my thoughts on the matter. My name is Gary Hendershot. I'm known on the uh, internet as Smart Scarecrow. I've got a website at smartscarecrow.com. I'm Smart Scarecrow on Twitter. I'm Smart Scarecrow on YouTube. Um, I'm easy to find. I don't even hide from the bill collectors. Don't buy. Don't comply. Ask why. That is our motto here at unitedwestrike.com. Noncompliance, peaceful noncompliance has been our philosophy from day one. And I hope that people around the world can, can, can engender that, can decide that they have the personal power and freedom to choose not to believe in the lies, not to participate in their own destruction by eating GMO foods, brushing with fluoridated toothpaste, drinking fluoridated water. Non-compliance means we can stay healthy, and the human uh, species has a chance to exist. And that's what keeps me coming back to unitedwestrike.com, is this idea that there is more of us than there are of them. And if we apply, like Gary says, force through peaceful non-compliance, we foil their plans. We, we wreck their agenda, then they will have to apply more drastic means, which will be, will be mentally and spiritually prepared for, and then that will fail. And that's when it collapses, and we start at the more local level, I believe, hope, perhaps. Uh, but we can start at the local level rebuilding what we believe is, is, is a good form of government with fair and honest justice. Maybe that's what it'll take. And I think it's what's probably coming. I appreciate all of you uh, joining us this evening. It is always a pleasure and intriguing for me to listen to all of you, so intelligent people, and it makes me feel so humble to be even uh, be able to mingle among such, such intellectual, spiritually aware individuals. So I appreciate your participation in the UnitedWeStrike.com marathon. I'd like to thank our producers again, Gary Detliff and Alan, for their hard work. And I'd like to thank you, our listening audience. Please spread the word about UnitedWeStrike.com. Tell your friends, family, neighbors about the things you learn here because it is important for them as well. And the more of us that we can plant, have planting seeds, the more blossoms that will occur. And if we have these little victories like in Vermont or Hawaii or, or Nevada, then maybe those victories start blossoming around the world as well. And that is our hope tonight. Thank you all again. Until next month, folks. Five, four, three, two, one. Death yes. to the new world, world order. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night, Good night. Cheers, Good night. Bye-bye. Join unitedwestrike.com radio on the second Saturday of every month for our live international radio marathon. Don't buy, don't comply, ask why. 